Hello, and thank you for joining us for a deep dive into automated production at the Makers Pop-Up. I'm Adrian Pennington, a journalist and content editor covering media production and technology. And this is Virtual Creative Muse, AI as artistic mentor and production assistant. So far, computer-driven algorithms don't appear to have made huge inroads into media and entertainment, but appearances can be deceptive. There are a lot of people either skeptical or just plain unsure about AI's potential. Others are really positive about its future. There seems little doubt that AI tools will increasingly become used in production. Tease out exactly where AI is being used today and what impact it's having and where the tech's going tomorrow. We have with us a group of experts with unparalleled insight. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Before we look inside the machine, could I just invite you to introduce yourself, um, some of your background and the company you represent. Eve, uh, can I invite you to start, please? Sure. Hi, uh, my name is Eve Berquist. I am the director of the AI and Neuroscience in Media project at the Entertainment Technology Center at USC, where we run uh, an AI R&D lab that's funded by all the Hollywood studios to apply AI to the, the full gamut of challenges in the media industry. And then parallel to that, I have a startup called Cordo, um, developing AI products for, for media, uh, studios, big brands, uh, ad agencies uh, based in LA. Thank you. Um, Nadira? Yes. Hi, my name is Nadira Azarme, and I'm the founder and CEO of Scriptbook, a tech startup that provides AI-driven script analysis, AI validation of content, box office forecasting, and more recently, AI content generation. That's very interesting. Um, Sri, um, how are you today? Yeah, I'm good. Thank you, Adrian, and thank you for having me today. I'm Sri, and uh, I head products and partnerships uh, for Adobe Audio, Video, and Motion, uh, which consists of uh, flagships like Premiere Pro, After Effects, Audition, um, and you know they are all kind of powered by Sensei, which is a proprietary AI and ML technology, which is why I'm excited to speak here today. To be honest, I, uh, you know, to this crowd, I'm, I'm fairly new to the world of media and entertainment. You know, I joined Adobe as a pandemic baby. So as someone who has never set foot in the office or never met his colleagues in person ever, uh, I can attest to the power of cloud and AI. Otherwise, I would be dead in the water in this uh, in this strange and crazy year. Uh, before joining Adobe, I spent about 12 years at Salesforce, where I used to head uh, various products and partnerships under the flagship sales cloud, as well as uh, areas like relationship intelligence, mobile productivity, as well as uh, AI, machine learning, and deep learning platforms. And before that, I had a completely different uh, avatar as a traveling consultant, where you know, for a decade or so, I traveled across the globe and uh, you know worked across the globe in many sectors and industries. Um, at Adobe, my focus is to you know further our vision, creativity for all, uh, by making sure that uh, we are bringing these tools uh, to empower creatives to do their best work. So yeah, I'm I'm really glad to be here, and thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. Yeah, um, avatar. That's an interesting concept. Roy, I think you've had a few avatars in your your career so far. Can you tell us um, about those, please? Sure. My name is Roy C. Anthony, and I'm the global head of research at DNEG. DNEG is a global visual effects, feature animation, and TV um, content studio. We produce highly produced content uh, for each one of those areas, as well as other applications in media and entertainment. I've joined as the head of research and our research office is looking into the application of real-time technologies, AI and machine learning um, to as impacted to the production process. That's great. Thank you all very much. So let me just uh, let me just begin this with a, with a kind of a, a round robin starter. Um, there's been lots of quotes uh, in uh, in various keynotes and in the press over the past couple of years uh, about how important AI is. Uh, various quotes from Amazon or heads of Amazon, Google, Nvidia uh, that AI is the most powerful technology of our time. Uh, that we're in a golden age of automation, or that AI is more profound than fire or electricity. Um, just would everyone give their opinion as to how important they feel AI is uh, in the media and entertainment space? Uh, Roy, would you like to uh, kick us off, please? Yeah, absolutely. We're really excited about AI here at DNEG, uh, specifically about the applications in accelerating workflows. 
Um, accelerating workflows for technicians and technologists, yes, absolutely. Uh, when it comes to denoising, upscaling, uh, all of those uh, applications, style transfer, et cetera. Um, but we are most excited, I think, about the implications as to how it can change the creative process, providing more opportunities for iteration, more self-discovery, and really freeing the creators to do what they do best, create art. That's very interesting, okay. Um, Shri, where, 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 do you, uh, where do you stand on the status of, of AI uh, in, the, in, in the world or in media entertainment? Totally. Um, you know, uh, you, you packed a lot in your, in your opening statement and this question. So I think the long beyond this. So, you know, let me start with fire and then maybe we'll address electricity, right? So I think there's a parallel here between human evolution and the technological revolution cycles that we've seen to kind of build a framework to understand the role and impact of AI, right? So if you if you think about it, the earth is about four and a half billion years old and you know life has been here for about three and a half billion or so. And before you come to discoveries like fire or wheel or even the famous Crescent Valley about 10,000 years ago, I think there was a cognitive evolution, maybe about 70,000, right? That's where we as a species started climbing up the food chain, things like burial, cave arts, body arts, et cetera, you get the gist. To me, I think AI is in that kind of penultimate stage right now in terms of the technological years, right? So if you think about it, we've had four industrial revolutions, right? We've had steam, electricity, computers, internet, I believe we are at the dawn of this new age. And to me, the future is full of hope, optimism. I'm, I'm really envious actually of the, of the coming generations because I think the future is just going to be so much more awesome. Um, so once we kind of hit that uh, inflection point, if you will, I, I, I think there'll be no stopping back, right? Now, specifically to answer media and entertainment, I think the last year in itself has kind of proven that the tech roadmaps for a lot of companies in the space has been accelerated by about seven to 10 years. So, for example, cloud, uh, which was still on the on the verge of uh, these companies, is now table stakes, right? So, similarly, I think AI is the next uh, you know step. If you think about it, there's a system of creation where a lot of these companies play, and then there's a system of engagement uh, because now teams have to collaborate. You know, all of us are in different countries and different geographies, but here we are having a conversation. So that's the engagement layer. And then the top of the pyramid is system of intelligence, and I think we are getting there. Thank you, Sri. Perhaps, perhaps the next stage is the singularity, singularity, then, which I read about in science fiction, where somehow humans port their consciousness into a greater AI. Perhaps we'll get to that in, uh, shortly. Um, Nadira, what, what do you feel about um, the statement that uh, AI is that we're living in a golden age of AI? Well, it's true. I think we do live in a golden age. Um, and AI is part of everyday life. You know, uh, people make use of AI tools without knowing it. Um, when it comes to the use of AI in media and entertainment, I think it will become a very important, very important in the next years. It, we haven't reached that point yet because we deal with an industry that is a slow adopter. You know, if it, AI is integrated in other industries, it usually takes you know, let's say a couple of years for a, a film and television business to catch up. So it will become crucial, but we're not there yet. We're not at the height of what it can do in film and television or in media and entertainment. Not at the height of, uh, not, not at the height of what it can do in media entertainment. Uh, Eve, uh, wh what do you feel about that? Yeah, I, uh, I'm gonna disagree with everyone being the Frenchman in the room. Um, we're not in the golden age of AI, not even close. We're in the golden age of computation. And there's a big difference between computation, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. We're in the golden age of data. We're the golden age of computational representations of that data and, and building applications that are, you know, heavily, uh, that rely heavily on computation and data to, to make, uh, to automate a bunch of processes. That's a, that's a long way from actual machine learning, right? And it's and, and machine learning is a long way from artificial intelligence. Um, so and and frankly, if you've built any AI application, um, you would never defend the case that we're in the golden age of AI. I mean, it's blood, sweat, and tears. Okay, and 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 most AI um, 
uh, initiatives in large corporations fail because people don't really understand AI. They don't really understand machine learning. The data is wrong. The, the, um, the constraints around the data are considerable. Um, the constraints around the commercial use of the data, the legal frameworks around using that are considerable. The constraints around ethics now are considerable. So um, we may be entering uh, an acceleration of the deployment of machine learning and AI methods in large corporations overall. Um, there's an enormous amount of bottlenecks, education, awareness. Nobody really understands what it is. Uh, people think it's either magic or that it doesn't work. So there's sort of the opinions are very polarized. Um, uh, you know, the data the data is 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 wrong. The formats are wrong. I mean, there's just an enormous amount of small little details in any machine learning or AI project that can go wrong, and generally they do. So again you have to be really, really careful because at the ground level, at the level of people like me and my team, we're building this stuff. It's just an enormous amount of complexity. As far as the media and industry is concerned, um, you know, I, I, I would um, agree with Roy that most of the um, attention, uh, budgets and energy, rightfully so, in the media industry is around uh, workflows production and post-production workflows. There's, there's a lot to automate. There's a lot of stuff in like, you know, video QC, upscaling, localization, stuff like that. That's a pure machine learning stuff. Um, there's good data. Um, the, 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 the deep learning algorithms are, are you know, are, are pretty good for it. So if we're going to see something happen, it's going to be in that arena. But I can tell you, I'm just coming out of two sets of roundtables with, all the Hollywood studios about their pinpoints in AI. And I can tell you, um, we're still um, in the very, 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 very early stages of machine learning and AI deployment in, uh, in the media industry. Again, lots of cultural uh, organizational issues, lots of issues around the availability of clean, plentiful training sets to train, you know, supervised machine learning algorithms. There's now on top of that ethical issues. So it's a very, very complex thing and not just for the media industry, but any industry. But um, I would say production, post-production workflows is where we're going to see a lot of a lot of action in the next few years. Thank you. Just to, just to follow up on that then, uh, the, the view from Hollywood since since uh, you're close to it, um, uh, is, there, is there confusion as, you, as you've as you described about what AI is? Uh, are people very skeptical of AI's use in the creative process? Or is there an element of uh, optimism among some uh, executives that AI can, can cut costs? So um, there is... Um... A lot of excitement. I think there's, first of all, the, the notion that the media industry is clueless about AI is not true. Like they're, they're, they're very, very well informed. Um, they're very, they're investing money. They're investing meaningful amounts of money towards it. So I think we've really crossed the threshold. Like when I started working with Hollywood on AI stuff six years ago, um, people looked at me like it was completely crazy, right? Um, and now there's real budgets. There's executives who want to experiment. There's, there's a, a lot of appetite for it. Um, in the production post-production world, I think there's an enormous amount of interest in the development and marketing stages, right? Because that's where a lot of the intuitive decisions are being made. And so we've done a lot of work um, assessing audiences at the script stage right uh, and that's there's a huge interest around that um the experience are really meaningful and then it sort of ties together development and marketing you know because you start doing the marketing at the development stage and that's kind of what we're trying to do so there's there's some meaningful experiments there um but i would say in terms of ai and creative this is kind of the third rail of of hollywood right uh this the the conversations are very sensitive um i don't think the technology is there to be really honest with you the technology is not there to be able to meaningfully contribute to the creative process um it's very culturally sensitive um so on, on all on all levels i think there's sort of intrigued questions but um we're a long way from a meaningful use of artificial intelligence in the creative process. I think for good reason, because the technology is not ready, right? And, and even uh, GPT-3 is um, 
sort of coherent from a grammatical standpoint, but definitely not from a story structure standpoint. So we still, the, 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 the hurdles to using AI in creative are some of the hardest hurdles in artificial intelligence, period. And so we're a long way from that. Yeah, thanks, um, Eve. That, that was really interesting. So I just wanted to pick up on, on what you were saying there about uh, the interest that uh, executives in Hollywood uh, are, f- are feeling about AI with regards to the, the production process. Nadira, you're very involved in that with, uh, with script analysis tools, amongst other things. Can you, can you talk us through uh, what developments you're seeing and how your company is developing AI tools for, for in that area? Mm-hmm. Well, our focus is uh, AI-driven script analysis. And um, first of all, I think I have to go back to what Eve was saying earlier. You know, um, it's it's we're not there yet, and there's still a lot of work, and it's not the golden age yet. But I think um, sometimes I think done is better than perfect, and any progress that we're making is good progress. And with regards to AI-driven script analysis, for example, um, you have, for example, a company that has hundreds or thousands of scripts on a yearly basis. Obviously, you know, they, they have a team or they have interns reading them, um, making or writing coverage on, on a certain project, and it's not scalable. That's one case where AI is tremendously helpful because it's uh, automated, scalable, and it's very efficient. So if you can have a use case like that, where, where AI actually just kind of processes all of the incoming scripts, um, you know, and, and gives you a, a very sophisticated output, um, that's, that's one thing that I see in companies. They think about efficiency. They also think about how can they combine um, you know, AI analysis versus human coverage, because an uh, assessment done by a computer is completely different than assessment done by a human being. Um, so I think that's one of the use cases that is uh, interesting to companies uh, in, uh, in, in this space, um, but also the validation, um, which I see uh, more probably with distributors and sales agents, because uh, up until today, sales agents and distributors distributors are, uh, were making use or probably are still making use of uh, old fashioned ways of, of decision making. And if they can have an objective tool that kind of guides them um, towards, you know, with which territories will do well, um, what kind of um, forecasts uh, are they seeing in specific territories in specific countries um, that can actually help them um, make the right decision and see whether they are ready or willing to pay certain uh, MGEs, uh, wh- whether they're ready to, to pay certain distribution fees. So all of that uh, is also uh, a very interesting use case for that specific group. And I think lastly, we should not forget about just the random Jane and John Doe, uh, like independent producers, filmmakers, film students, uh, amateur writers, this is a group that is always passed by uh, because they're probably regarded as less interesting because, you know, they're just a one man show um, and tend not to have a lot of funding. But this is a group that comes to us for help as well, uh, which was to me very surprising because initially I thought that, you know, the bigger companies like studios and talent agencies and large production production companies would be, uh, you know, early adopters and they would be the ones really, you know, uh, jumping on this AI bandwagon. But I see that this large group from just regular people trying to make content, trying to write good scripts and getting a foot in the door are actually uh, one of, is becoming uh, one of the largest groups using technology, using AI, and they make up a large portion of our users. That's fascinating. I want to pick up uh, on that in a moment, actually. Um, but let me let me just turn to to Shri and um, can you tell us, uh, Shri, a little bit about how uh, uh, AI, with regards to sensor, I guess, is being used uh, within the post production process, perhaps to help editors uh, and and graders and other other creatives uh, do their job. Absolutely, yeah. So I do share the optimism with Nadira here. I think AI can play. And when I say AI, I'm, I'm using it as a broader definition to Eve's point, right? Like it's AI, ML, 
and all of the productivity that machine learning and all these uh, workflow automations kind of bring to the, to the, to the post-production process, I think uh, it can actually save, you know, one of the research that we had was about 30% of an editor's time is spent in non-creative work today, right? So think about things like organizing shots or captioning or translating the same content in 30 different languages or auto-framing the same content to be published across various social media channels. Like these things are not a part of the creative workflow, if you will. So minimizing the time that you spend here helps uh, you know, the creatives and the post-production professionals keep their focus on the creative process, right? And they still meet the deadlines. It's a, it's a very high pressure sh- job. And in some ways, you know, they could actually exceed their clients' expectations, right? So a few examples of things that I've personally been championing and we have pushed, uh, I would say over the past year or so, um, you know, again, talking about the uh, scripting process, speech to text is a great example in Premiere Pro. So if you think about it, it's, uh, it's a feature that has auto captions uh, and that can translate in about, you know, I don't know, maybe about 20, 30 languages when it, when it goes to GA. Uh, but the use cases are infinite, you know, again, back to Nuri's point, you know, you can think about uh, auto scripting, you can think about so many other use cases when this technology kind of flourishes, right? Scene edit detection is another example, roto brush in After Effects, content aware fill again in After Effects. Uh, you know, color is again a, a very fascinating area. Uh, personally, I feel that if you think about the color journey so far in the production process, uh, it's not uh, something that has had a huge equity uh, because uh, you know a lot of color palettes, even today, I think, uh, cater to the white tones. Uh, they don't cater to the global tones that we have available. But I think AI can kind of bring that level playing field if you apply the knowledge and data sets that you have across the globe. Uh, so Lumetri Color Match Panel uh, is again a great example. Um, you know, it's also important to call out that all these technologies in themselves can take you to the, I would say the 80th or 90th percentile, but still puts the creative in charge, right? Uh, again, to go back to the color example, the colorists can still take over the workflow and give it their creative touch. It's not to say that the AI is going to take over the entire process, but it helps them get pretty far along the process, right? Auto ducking is one of my favorite features. You know, when I watch a lot of, uh, TV, I'm still surprised when the the dialogues are not audible, uh, you know, and the background music or the sound effects just take over. And this is, again, a, a ripe area where AI can just auto-duck and ensure that uh, the, the final creative content kind of matches the user's expectations, right? So I think there are a lot of possibilities and we have made a lot of strides in this area. Thank you, Sri. Um, so, so, Roy, uh, do, do you uh, do you go along with what 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 Shri has said there about uh, AI being being able to uh, give a boost to the the production process, and then and then creatives can come in on top of that uh, and give that ten percent of uh, of their own creativity to it. To, to what extent is can AI be the creative muse to to really en- uh, enhance and and develop um, uh, develop the content? I'll address uh, those two questions just separately. The Muse, uh, secondarily, and then first on the on the acceleration. So I do I do agree with Sri about uh, you know the potential here to kind of take um, labor- laborious, time consuming tasks uh, and simplify them, or get uh, an artist to the almost uh, almost complete part. Obviously, those those last uh, you know thirty percent, twenty percent, we could put any number on it. Uh, th- those those polishing passes are the ones that actually consume possibly the most time. So getting to that point as soon as possible is critical. Um, and in certain workflows, uh, depending on what the task is you're doing, we can pick on rotomation for uh, so just, just as an example. Uh, in, in that process, you, you know, getting to a point with a single plate, uh, one frame um, is, is one thing, but then having to do that on subsequent frames uh, from scratch every single time can be extremely fatiguing. So this is a good application for machine learning training um, a machine you know to do a specific kind of task and then execute that task to a best fit in order to be able to get it so that the artist can pick that up and then take it that final that final stretch so i i do think as an assistive tool uh, machine learning trained algorithms and other tooling in and around the ai spectrum can be something that's going to help creative stay creative 
and avoid uh, spending billable hours just doing uh, tasks that either they consider boring or mundane or tasks that are um, you know, focused in and around non-artistic pursuit, right? So they have more opportunity to be creative. Um, on the Muse side, this is the part that I think is really exciting. Uh, in in most, of, most of the broken models and research that I see, I see lots of opportunities for, uh, you know, engagement and creating variance. Uh, you know, a, a failure with a machine learned trained solution, like let's say, for example, texture generation, um, this can actually be quite a, a positive thing. Like if you have a standard stock texture and you need to be able to augment this in some way and you want to get as many variants as possible, throwing it into a machine and changing some parameters around is kind of a cool way of getting that from a static asset. Obviously, if you have a procedural workflow, this isn't a problem that you have, but you know, for those times where you have maybe photography-based uh, texture assets, this is something that can be really, really useful or informative. And then if we think about the animation side, you know, getting character work done, you know, being able to have a static asset and you know, use some performance capture or some other typically noisy or messy data uh, as an input um, uh, for an example, and then use the machine to create um, some variations or variants that might be something that could inspire a direction or an action. Um, you know, again, it, like that palette of potential options, it's almost like AI becomes your little production assistant that works with you and kind of throws lots of ideas around with you and lets you again, kind of drive at the, towards that final uh, creative intent or goal. Little friendly AIs. That's it's, it's, a, it's a nice friendly idea. But you, you, so you're talking there about developments on 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 the way to uh, creating AI helping helping the creator create, perhaps even creating its own IP. I, and, and, and Nadira, you mentioned that you were that you were developing towards uh, the, the AI could create its own uh, content. Is could you elaborate a bit on that? And, and if, if everyone else can 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 also talk to to that point about AI. Be, creating its own IP? Is that something desirable, something possible? Where are we, all, where are we on that pathway? Well, first of all, when, when um, we were building our first platform, the AI-driven uh, script analysis platform, our focus was on analyze and predict. But I think probably in the, the second year that Scriptbook, uh, in Scriptbook's existence, we kind of knew that uh, within the next years, uh, probably, uh, the industry would move to maybe AI engineered content. So that's where Deep Story came, uh, well, came about. We thought, of, let's see if we could actually train a generative model and kind of feed it some parameters that we uh, have, features that we have from our um, first platform and see what it will do for us. To be honest, when we started working on it, we thought it would be fun. We didn't see it as potentially becoming a product that people will use. Uh, but, um, and, and also when I spoke to companies or just to people about, um, you know, having an AI uh, driven script engine, um, most people, you know, um, just kind of gave me the look about this is weird I don't think this is going anywhere and for me it was just seeing is there uh, a group of people that would be interested in using this so we launched our beta version of this uh, AI driven um, um, a generator or engine as you want to call it to see whether how, how people would interact who are the users why are they using this and is it true like when you hear companies that writers are very protective of their art and they're easily offended if you bring in certain enhancers of creativity let's see if that's the case now when we launched this beta version of the engine very basic interface you know you just literally go on to and you start generating your scene header you have it's 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 uh, it understands structure, so it will automatically generate scripted content according, let's say, the final draft software. Um, let's see what people uh, if pe people are going to use this and how do what's the feedback? How do they feel about it? In January, we started off with 200 users a month, so I thought, okay, that's not huge. Maybe you know there isn't really interest. But today we have 15,000 users a month. So it's, 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 it's growing tremendously and the feedback that we're getting and, and the insight that we're getting from the users is that it, they're just regular people 
um, dreaming of writing, not necessarily having experience or the right studies, but they want to write their own stories. So all of these users, you know, we're, we're not using any marketing, we're not promoting this in any way because it's still beta and we're trying to figure out, you know, where to go with such, a, with such an engine. All of the traffic, all of these 15,000 users, current users, you know, they find us organically. Uh, the most hyped word is AI engine, AI storytelling engine, and they end up on deep story. They use it for generation because they just want to become creators. They want um, some sort of a tool that will help them become better in, 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 in this kind of art. And also, um, I will kind of make the link towards, you know, IP and whether this engine is able of, of uh, creating its full story, of course. But you have to make a nuance. AI-generated content is not human-generated content. I always think of humans as the editors of the story. So if you generate AI-driven story, you need humans to make it kind of human, better edited, maybe, you know, change certain arcs. But the AI can, of course, generate a full story. Will the story make sense? Perhaps, perhaps not. Will it be entertaining? Most likely. Now, the mindset that needs to, to change in the next coming years is that will the industry accept AI-driven content? Will the industry be open to actually producing, making content that was completely generated by an AI? And looking at today's audiences, you know, if people can watch for hours dance videos and, and, and stupid life hacks on certain platforms, you know, uh, we, it, it shows you that today's audience is they're younger, they're the millennials and the generation that comes after the millennials, probably they won't be as, as um, let's say, uh, the stricter audience that we're used to, you know, the traditional audiences that like uh, long form storytelling with a, a purpose and they need to get a catharsis out of the story. No, probably these audiences will find this enjoyable. And also one last thing, is about generator content. This is something that I struggle with because we log the percentage of AI generated content versus the human input. And we see it tends to go towards 70, 30, 70 AI generated, 30 human. And of, of course, we get also the feedback that uh, the users using the software are telling us, can we get rid of the watermark uh, with deepstory.ai because they want to pass it on as their own. So the question right there is, how about legislation? I mean, how do we go uh, move forward uh, by telling this story was created by a human and an AI? The percentage of AI was 70%, percentage by human 30%. How do you share that, that ownership? All of these questions pop up, but we don't have an answer today. Um, because I don't have them. And whenever I ask around, it seems that other people don't have them as well. So I think that will be the challenge for the coming years. I, I think uh, I think Eve might be able to shed some light on this um, because when you talk about AI being say 70% and human input 30%, I mean, the AI itself presumably has been trained on uh, on data which was originally owned by, by humans. It has also have some copyright attached to it. So I wonder Eve, if you could tell us about some of the ethical issues that you were talking about uh, in your introduction, um, if indeed this is what you mean by, eth by ethical issues to, when, when we're dealing with um, IP, uh, so AI content creation. Mm -hmm. So um, first of all, I think these, these story generation experiments are really interesting and, and they should happen, right? Um, uh, the, the, it really depends what you mean by content, right? So can, can uh, a, a machine agent uh, write a press release, probably. Can they write a, a, a phone call, someone making a reservation uh, for a restaurant, probably. If we're talking about story generation with a narrative structure, it is impossible right now. And the bottlenecks to that are the largest bottlenecks in artificial intelligence today, which is how do you abstract low level data into symbolic representations programmatically without the help of uh, libraries. So you have a lot of libraries that are gonna map certain words to certain 
narratives and stuff like that, right? But I'm talking about ground up uh, machine readable narrative structure. And that is going to be uh, a, a sort of a fairly long way because the, the AI community doesn't actually agree on basic definitions of what that would look like. So, so we're a very long way from that. Uh, the in the state of the art, which is which is GPT three, um, can write very coherent um, text, you know, very grammatically coherent cogent text. And remember, it has billions of parameters. Uh, it has yet to write a coherent story narrative. So we're a very very long way from that. Um, in terms of of uh, ethics, the there's there's an enormous amount of of issues around the data that was used to train your model right? if if and and we're really trying to to solve that at USC by putting together the largest database of scripted and and video content for all the studios to use as a common training pool for their own models um, but I can tell you the the legal uh, challenges to that are are enormous and frankly we're in unknown territory as far as the ethics go as far as the, the IP implications go because you have to remember some of this content was written with contracts that did not include a clause on you know machine intelligence right so new contracts do have these clauses but for for the most part um, that content was generated was generated um, uh, without any kind of IP protections or, or an IP framework to understand what that looks like. If you use this content to train a model, who, know, who owns the model? So um, we are um, at the very early stages of it, uh, number one. Number two, big studios are thinking about it very aggressively and very intelligently, in my view. Um, number three, things will happen in the next few years that will unlock this potential, at least from a legal and organizational standpoint. Um, you know, what, um, what we have started measuring for writers is how unique their different narrative attributes are, right? And, and instead of making predictions, which we don't think is possible, um, we give them at least currently, we give them a lot of context about this is where your narrative fits in the landscape of narrative and audience segments around that because we put together the content data, the performance data, and also social media, billions of social media conversations. And that's very valuable. What I think a lot of the creatives and decision makers around creative lack is context. Right? This script will resonate in this way with these audience segments. And by the way, these are the attributes of your story that they're really gonna latch onto. So therefore, this is how you put your production money, right? For this project, people will be very, will pay close attention to the story, not so much to the cast. They'll pay really close attention to the VFX, et cetera. So this is how you put your money in the production process. I think delivering, if we can deliver more signals to make content creators slightly more data-driven and audience savvy than they are today because they just don't have the tools. Um, it's already hundreds of millions of dollars of value. And you have to remember media, media content uh, generation and production is such an enormous, it's a $2 trillion global industry, right? So if we just um, make a 5% optimization, it's, it's an enormous amount of money. And you have to really kind of think about it in these terms. It's like, we're going from, a certain culture to another culture that is slightly optimized in the meantime, generating hundreds of millions of dollars of value with very, very simple things, some of which aren't even AI. So um, there's an education piece uh, clearly needed. Is there, uh, I think you're alluding to it there, Eve, is there also a, um, a new set of skills needed to be able to work with AI and understand AI uh, from a creative point of view, or indeed a producer's point of view, what, what does everyone think about that? New, a new set of uh, maybe some training, maybe some skills, maybe maybe just yeah. So 100. percent And as a matter of fact, we are rolling out a training program for media executives, uh, for media executives and and uh, executives more that are more IT executives in the studio system, in order to 
accelerate. I mean, this is the biggest bottleneck in in adoption, not just in media everywhere, right? It's the uh, incapacity to think computationally. So, so we're rolling out a computational thinking course that will be directed towards non-technical media executives. We have a special course for them, and we have a special course for technical media executives in order to um, sort of it's sort of it's about greasing the wheels, if you will, of the organization and make it a little bit more receptive and more understanding of the possibilities and the constraints of AI. Roy, what do you think about that? Thinking computationally, is that something, I reckon you do that already. <laughs> yeah, so the research guide's kind of built in. It's uh, definitely 100% sure. I think uh, what uh, Eves is describing as uh, education with a capital E, uh, all up and down the chain is probably a great thing to have, especially at the executive level. I think um, he's probably going to be very successful um, uh, with this because uh, when it comes comes down to AI and machine learning, uh, there is a lot of excitement. There's a lot of buzz uh, and there's a lot of talk about potential applicability, but there are a lot of big questions like we've covered here today. And uh, some of them are kind of in and around, you know, what it can and cannot do. So some fundamentals are definitely going to be, I think, well received by, uh, uh, by the market, generally speaking. Um, when it comes to us in, internally, you know, we're we're gearing up. Like like I mentioned uh, in an earlier uh, response, the the technology is nascent. You know, is it a golden age? Mm, you know, are we are we at the cusp of a transformative stage? Absolutely. Um, you know, the the tools are very nascent and they are assisted at this at this stage. Um, and I think a, a broader understanding of what that is and what that means uh, is going to be really important even when it comes down to uh, AI and how it's, how it's used with respect to the business. You know, is it, is it going to, uh, is it gonna do something for the bottom line? I honestly think it's going to be doing something a little bit different and that's letting us focus on creating quality stories, high quality output content for people to enjoy. Just a quick so, one to end, sorry. Um, yeah, just a quick one to end. Uh, so education is important and we, we understand that it's at an early stage. Uh, the technology, but what 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 is what excites you, or what is coming down the track in terms of technology, where we might see a breakthrough moment uh, in, in this field? I mean, I know it's about more compute, more storage, more power, and that kind of. But is there anything specific that you can see, perhaps in your own developments, that uh, you can just point us towards? Sri, have you got something? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, a lot of small things are are happening, and as, as I said earlier. Uh, it's very difficult to predict a specific feature or specific inflection point. To that extent, I do agree with Eves and Roy uh, that today AI is more about computational intelligence. It's more about the assistive features. Uh, but you know, going back to the script and and the whole conversation that we just had, you know, one of the things that we are uh, investigating is can AI, for example, not author a complete script, but can it at least, given all the parameters, produce a rough cut or produce a trailer, you know, and so on and so forth. So, so I think personally, my approach and our approach to AI is, is helping our users and helping our users serve their customers better. Because I think that's the best way to kind of make a dent here and to kind of garner more acceptance and, and get more people from the camp where uh, they are they are you know questioning or more inquisitive about AI to to the camp where they are more enthusiastic about AI and we can do that by helping them get better at their jobs and helping them with the creative outputs so it's a journey it'll happen and then at some point you know with Eves and uh, and all the education that that uh, that the universities and all of us are are producing hopefully we will reach that inflection point. Uh, but yeah, it's a, it's a journey, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Nadira, do you have uh, do you have anything to add on that one? Yeah. Um, first, one one thing um, about education is education is crucial, uh, uh, especially in, in in our field in the, in the entertainment field. But it also, a change of mindset is crucial because if you only focus on education, it's like casting pearls before swine. The mindset of creatives, the mindset of um, of entertainment executives needs to change as well. That's one thing that I that I think is very important. Uh, secondly, also what I am excited about uh, is also that AI tools will uh, democratize the space. If you make AI tools available to everybody, all of a sudden, you know, it's 
the 99% gets access to these creative enhancers and not just the 1%. I think that is something that excites me for the next coming years, especially if you consolidate many AI tools into one ecosystem, because there's a lot of fragmentation happening in this space. I'm just talking about film and television. You have, you know, the screenwriting software, you have the script analysis, the script readers, the screenwriting so software, uh, sorry, screenwriting competitions. Uh, there's too much going on and there's no uh, consolidation. I think if we, um, uh, for the coming years, if, if this industry manages to kind of consolidate all of these AI tools into one ecosystem and kind of opens it up, this is the first step towards democrat democratizing this business, democratizing entertainment. Everybody can create, everybody has an opportunity, has a shot. Uh, I think that will lead to better content, more interesting content, original content, and, and, and that's going to benefit everybody. Terrific. That's a very positive note to end on. Thank you so much for your time. It's a fascinating conversation. Thank you, Roy, Sri, Nadira and Eve for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.